morning today, and the technological, ethical, and existential implications um, that will become a reality if this technology and procedure is realized in the future. So I just want to start by saying um, that humanity, from general public to biological scientists, have often been fascinated by the idea of human cloning as is reflected in the uh, sci-fi entertainment um, um, features such as movies, it's a popular topic. And that's one reason why I wanted to discuss this. If this was actually realized, what would be the real um, um, implications like psychological, moral, religious, social, economic, if this was to become reality? So I will start with um, deciphering reproductive cloning from therapeutic cloning and what current technologies we do have that can clone a human or mammals and the implications and dangers of this technology and then the current legal status of cloning and human cloning specifically. Then I will uh, move on to an in-depth ethical stance covering many realms of ethics. Um, as well as the psychological implications to society and the human clone itself. Um, as well as global changes in the medical field regarding human cloning, such as mental health. And um, the possibility of a dystopian future if this was to become actualized. And the finishing with the concept of medicine writ large in the future regarding human cloning. So, um, reproductive cloning versus therapeutic cloning. The main difference is that um, in reproductive cloning, there's no implantation of the blastocyst in a uterus and there's no birth of a human being. Instead, um, the, the zygote is formed, it can be formed in vitro, and um, it is cultured and the blastocyst is terminated at um, that stage. and um, pluripotent embryonic stem cells are formed and differentiated into specific cell types that the patient needs in order to produce organs and tissues from chemical messengers. And then this is then transplanted back into the patient. Um, so this is a less dramatic and more accepted form of cloning, which is legalized in some countries. But I'm going to be focusing on reproductive cloning, where there is implantation into the uterus, normal gestation of nine months, and a birth of a human being. Um, this is a more controversial uh, procedure, and it is illegal, and it has not been done to date for humans, but it has been done in 23 animal species. Um, yeah, there's two methods in which this can be done. The first is in vitro fertilization and embryo splitting, which is analogous to the formation of uh, monozygotic twins. Um, so of course, um, fertilization would occur in vitro, where the male sperm and the female egg would fuse. Um, at the zygote stage, when it's two cells, it would be mechanically separated into two zygotes. Um, and these will later go on to form blastocysts and can be implanted into uh, the uterus to form um, identical twins, which will be clones of each other, not formed of the parents, as they have um, haploid DNA from the male and female, so it's uh, similar to natural birth. Um, we can implant up to a maximum of four uh, blastocysts into the uterus as carrying capacity of a uh, female uterus. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, so they'll have the mitochondrial DNA from the mother, from the egg, because that's where it's from. And so they won't be. Um, this is will be an important point coming up. Okay, so the more dramatic um, technology is somatic cell nuclear transfer, where you only have one parent. Um, and just requires one set of DNA from one person where this is forming an exact clone. From a desired individual, cultured cell, frozen tissue, cell sample. So this brings about the notion of resurrection or de-extinction. Um, so how this occurs is the donor egg is 
um, removed from a woman, the nucleus is taken out, so it's a denucleated oocyte. oocyte. And um, the uh, subject which you want to clone, like I said, this can be from frozen tissue sample or a skin cell of an adult, is then inserted into the enucleated oocyte and um, division is stimulated via electrical impulse. And normal development occurs into a blastocyst, which is then implanted into a uterus, and normal gestation occurs, and the birth of this clone or wherever the tissue sample will be born after nine months. And an interesting note is that if you're the surrogate mother and the egg donor, you can use your own somatic cell and create a clone and give birth to yourself, which is a strange situation. Of course, there'll be an age gap. Um, okay, and then so um, so far, 23 mammal species have been successfully cloned using somatic cell nuclear transfer, ranging from mice, sheep, cattle, dogs, even an extinct species, which was the bocardo, which is similar to a mountain goat. Of course, problems with this include that they had to find a similar species which they could use as a surrogate mother because, of course, the species was extinct. Um, so it was successfully born, but it was very short-lived and died moments after birth due to complications of just being from a frozen tissue sample and um, probably um, birth in the enucleated oocyte from a different species. Um, so the most notable mammal clones to date are, of course, Dolly the Sheep in 1997, which was a huge media success. And um, uh, three years after this, human cloning became a very hyped um, idea um, where this Time magazine uh, says human cloning is closer than we think. For couples who can't have a child or who have lost one, the unthinkable may soon be possible. Here are the perils. Of course, this was in 2001, and nothing really has advanced much since. It's still illegal. The closest thing which has happened is that in 2018, uh, macaque monkeys in China have been cloned using S uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. And this is important because they're a uh, primate, which is humans' closest living relatives. So it opens the possibility to um, successful human cloning. So these are the macaque monkeys that were cloned. Um, I just want to discuss now the dangers and implications of SCNT. The first of all, the success rates are very low. Um, for example, in this 2018 procedure, um, there were six pregnancies that were confirmed in 21 surrogates with only two healthy births. And then that's using fetal monkey fibroblasts, and then when using adult somatic cells, which would be the ideal situation for a cloning. Um, 22 pregnancies were confirmed in 42 surrogates and yielded only two babies that were short-lived. So you can see the vast amount of surrogates and unsuccessful births and pregnancies which happen and imagining this in human mothers, like the emotional emotional, and biological implications are severe. Um, and an important point is um, that we have to use, or so far, um, using fetal fibroblasts is the preferred method as it yielded more successful births and long-lived um, offspring. So technically, we, can, we only have the capability to clone um, babies that already exist. But if technology advanced, we could clone uh, adults. More dangers and implications of this technology are the phenomenon of large offspring syndrome, where th this can lead to enlarged placenta placenta and longer gestation periods so along the pregnancy, which again could be problematic to the human surrogate mother. Um, this is from a study done with um, cloning of cattle. And on the left here, this is an in vitro uh, cattle fetus with the large offspring syndrome. 
and then um, at 86 days gestation, and then on the right is um, 86 days of gestation of um, using artificial insemination, and that should be the normal size and the natural size of the fetus, and this is a result of culturing uh, the blastocyst previous to implantation in uterus. And then as well, genetic disorders can result, and there's an array, and this is usually due to um, genetic imprinting, which is methylation patterns that control transcription of genes endowed by mother and father. And um, additionally is death of offspring due to short-lived offspring or unsuccessful births, which is common using in cloning. Okay, so like I mentioned before, to date there has been no humans born or attempted to be born using um, any kind of method of cloning, including somatic cell nuclear transfer, as it is banned. And there's countless and numerous global legislation against this. This is a document from UNESCO and a quote from the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine says that any intervention seeking to create a human being genetically identical to another human being, whether living or dead, is forbidden. And then there's other acts, including the Human Reproductive Cloning Act, 2001, and Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, 2008. So you can see how Moore's law is kind of prohibited from being applied to um, medicine due to moratoriums and legislation. Okay, so in part two, I'm going to be doing an in-depth um, analysis of the ethical implications that could result if human cloning was realized. So there's countless uh, uh, ethical issues which could arise affecting society and humanity as we know it, including moral values um, on human reproductive cloning, and I have um, public polls from 2001 and 2015 from different regions showing how they feel on the issue. And also this brings up the idea of um, existentialism, what it means to be human, identity and purpose, and how creating human clones could completely shatter our current um, identity and purpose and meaning of humanity, as well as this enters religious realms um, and just the concept of creation in worldwide religions and how this could lead to a spiritual crisis, um, as well as the law and new legislation that will need to be enacted and enforced if human cloning becomes a reality. Will there be a separation between um, natural humans and cloned humans? Will there be a hierarchy and caste system that results a potential dystopia? And then the socioeconomic aspects, such as how will this technology be dispersed? Would it be privatized or public and available to those who need it and who has the right to it? Um, and also mental health of both the clone and um, a society in which uh, human clones exist. Okay, so. Shortly after the birth of Dolly the Sheep in 1987, there was a poll conducted in the UK in 2000, and um, it was people's response to just cloning in general. And 90% of the people thought that human cloning should be banned, and 67% thought that um, cloning of animals was unacceptable. So, fast forward a bit. Ooh, that much. Uh, to USA 2015. And um, still the top three emotions are interest and curiosity at 67%, anxiety at 44%, and fear at 31%, and then closely following is disgust and repugnance. But it's still not the 90%, it's it, it decreased and more people are interested and curious about it. The fear seemed to kind of disseminate. And when asked if human cloning should be illegal, there was actually an even split, almost 43% of people thought it should be, and 41 thought it shouldn't be. And then, um, is it immoral? Only 
37% of people thought it was immoral, and 37% of people thought um, that it wasn't immoral. So it's the, the opinions are not as contrasted as before. So now going into existentialism and altering the fabric of humanity, um, there's lots of literature on um, how this could affect um, humanity, like techniques and, and just the idea of revolutionary technology and where we're headed. So this quote here says, Technique, techniques such as germline intervention, human cloning, and synthetic biology have the potential to jeopardize basic features of the human species and our understanding of what it means to be human. So that's a pretty heavy quotation. Um, and the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine says that human cloning is contrary to human dignity. And if you think about it, it's kind of a regression in evolution as it's asexual reproduction, re replication which is similar to more basal organisms, and it unravels the fundamental essence of what it means to be human, which is um, to produce and um, sexually and create human beings, uh, evolution, and genetic diversity. This, this in turn, alters the gene pool. Um, diversity is reduced. It hinders evolution and humanity's ability to adapt in the long run, potentially. And this leads me to um, some existential questions, such as um, would the clones be considered human if it was created asexually? Um, would clones be inferior to natural born humans or superior? And would separate legislation exist, creating some kind of universal apathy between clones and non clones? And whose responsibility would it be to create this legislation and impose it? If anyone has any ideas. Um, just in regards to that second question, I feel like if this ever started to happen, um, humans born naturally would still like outnumber the clones, and I feel like it will probably be some form of discrimination towards them. Uh, whether or not they're actually physically inferior or not, um, I think you know, we've seen it time and time again where humans just like, they want to think that they're better than other things that they don't really understand about. So I feel like that might be a problem. Yeah. So while I do think that there's a possibility of discrimination, I feel as though when people take a step back and realize this thing that was created by us is still made of the same, um, same cells, same genes, and is capable of same things as we are, like uh, our consciousness and our morals and our apathy towards things, I think people will realize that we shouldn't treat them any different. And as for the second question, whether they would be inferior at all, um, if as long as they weren't like genetically enhanced, I believe they would be on the same playing field. But there also comes the question of nature versus nurture at this point, because let's say I create a clone that's the exact same copy as me, but they didn't have my parents, which I believe to be great influences. And I raised this uh, individual to be crappy, I guess. And so it, um, it kind of like, it kind of puts everything more into a, like a naturalistic uh, way that like puts greater emphasis in our social construct rather than um, this genetic being, I guess. Okay. I, I will explore that, uh, that point further in a hypothetical scenario. But yeah, great point. Yeah. I feel like not only is like the science behind it, obviously, but I just feel like humanity's not ready to be making clones yet. Because I mean like without clones we don't treat each other equally and we don't think that other people like are capable of us. Like there is like very clear discriminations that already exist without this like external um, clones or I don't know. And so I just I don't know. Like, I don't think we're ready for this, so I don't know if that's just an opinion. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Do you think that the future clones you're imagining are any different than current identical clones? Um, yes, because um, if they're taking from a somatic cell of someone who's already in existence, um, 
there may be identity and purpose uh, conflicts as they already previously existed. Whereas Bono was like Audi twins started from day one together and never had, they, they've always been on the same, in the same state of life as each other. With the same, uh, so it, it, yeah. it's something that humans haven't faced yet, this new relationship if you create a person from one of your cells and they're genetically identical to you, did you do that because you want them to become something, to do something? Pro probably so. So it creates a kind of, you know, malignant relationship, a very sort of unhealthy and abnormal relationship between parent and, and child. Usually, you're happy for your child to sort of go their own way and become their own person. Here, you're looking for this child to be like an extension of you, right? And so in what kind of society would that work? I think in a very dystopian society where everything has gone wrong and the wrong people are in charge, this probably would be the way, right? That, that there would be these high status evil people like, you know, Stalin, right? And so there, you, you create clones of, uh, you know, the leader and with, with the idea that this leadership will just, you know, perpetuate forever. So it, so it really is racism worse than you ever thought of. You know, you thought of racism just as races in general, but this is a discrimination against everybody who is not the leader, right? Which is like most people, right? So all those people who are not clones would like have no power and these cloned leaders would sort of continue on forever. Wouldn't they, wouldn't they realize pretty quickly that the clone of Stalin is not in fact him? It's more that he's a completely different person, just like my twin brothers. No, no, but but the society, the you know, the uh, government could enable an uh, education of this baby that that would ensure that that the child would have the same you know beliefs and 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 aims and so on as the as the father or. So I mean, it 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 really is uh, sort of you know apocalypse. It's it's one of the worst possible future outcomes. But you could imagine a future outcome like that, where the child had had no choice. The child might say, "Well, I want to study other stuff." <laughs> no, you have to be like your father. <laughs> yeah. Or like your mother, yes. Yeah. Um, so I believe that um, if given that scenario, that you raise an individual to mimic another person so that it's an extension of themselves, when you teach them certain things, I feel as though the human mind doesn't express nuances uh, as, as well as these uh, big pro uh, prevailing thoughts and I ideas and beliefs. So I think that if that were the case, I think progressively as the generations go on, not only will you retain the central beliefs of that individual, but I think they might even polarize to the point where might it's more worse. extreme. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. yes, yes. More mass killings and starvation and stuff. Yes. Yeah. So um, what you were saying kind of reminded me of this movie. Um, it's called Us, where they took a human clones and they kind of raised them underneath the world. And you can see in them, it's a, kind of like a horror film where you have the people underground trying to mimic the people underneath, but the people that they created did not have the same kind of uh, verbal or uh, mental capabilities as the people on top. And right. later on, um, the people underneath uh, retaliated and were trying to kill their others. So it's a very interesting movie to watch if, if you're interested. Yes, yeah. But you know, the other thing that I don't like about it is that I would like this course to promote ideas of how we can shape the future in a positive way 
And this is teaching us how to shape in a very <laughs> negative way. And I don't think we, we need those lessons. You know, future totalitarian leaders will be able to do that on their own. They don't really need our, our help today. I just have a few more slides uh, to go into ethics further. And um, this is now regarding religion and uh, the diversity of worldwide religions and um, their indi individual ideas um, around creation and how this could be a source of global spiritual attention and how uh, a constructive consensus between science and religion has not been met yet. And, um, the implications that they could have in the future with the reality of human cloning. And again, as previously discussed, just the need for new legislation once human clones are born, if we do see them as the other, um, where, or if we see them as equal, where we'd have to establish rights of clones. Um, and would they be rights equal to our rights? Um, and like I mentioned, there could be a possible divide creating a caste-like society based on hierarchy if they're not equal. And um, like I mentioned previously, although they're biologically human, would they be considered so? So just to explore the socioeconomic distribution of this technology, I have two scenarios. In the first scenario, if this was a privatized procedure, which would then be only available to the elite or the rich. Um, clients desiring a clone would most likely be from first world or wealthier countries such as uh, North, like Canada, USA, and um, Australia. And this could be mimicked with the organ trafficking, which is going on currently, where um, the recipients of organs are usually in these first world countries and the typical donors are from third world countries which will sell their organs for uh, a lower cost because their annual income is usually just around $480 per year whereas the recipient's annual income is around $53,000 a year if they were equated on the same currency. Um, so you can see how with privatized human cloning, this could be a problem as um, surrogate mothers and biological materials such as uh, eggs, oocytes, and equated could be outsourced to third world facilities where um, mass production of these clones could be produced for a cheaper price. And of course, like sanitation and safety of these facilities would not be up to par. But my uh, solution to this horrible situation um, is a uh, current technology that we have, which is the artificial womb. Um, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a bag. It's also called a bio bag, which is not a nice name. Um, but um, this is this has been done in 2017. Of course, it's not perfected, but it could be a reality and something that we could use instead of the outsourcing of of um, surrogacy to a third world country. And then, of course, scenario two, the much preferred one, is this being a public procedure available equally and fairly distributed um, through healthcare providers. So the ideal candidates and um, applicants would be infertile couples um, and individuals who wish to avoid passing on genetic disorders but want to have a family. And um, potentially couples who wish to replace a lost child um, versus a um, replacing like a lost parent because of course there'd be implications with consciousness and memories whereas a child has not formed as many memories and there's no age gap which would be um, that needs to be overcome. Okay, now I have a hypothetical ethical scenario which deals with resurrection and the identity, autonomy, and mental health of the clone. And that is um, if we had a frozen tissue sample from, let's say, the composer Beethoven, and we had decided to clone him, um, 
and he was cloned through somatic cell nuclear transfer, born, reached the age of about 10, and um, we tried to supply him with like musical instruments, give him music lessons. What if he didn't fulfill this? What if he wasn't even musically inclined? What if he didn't write any symphonies? Um, his notion of mother and father is completely shattered, and this again brings the topic of nature versus nurture. He isn't born in 1770 Germany. He would be born in hypothetically 2050 Canada. He wouldn't have the same parents, he wouldn't have the same surroundings, he wouldn't speak the same language, he wouldn't have the same memories. Would he be a composer? Would, would he even like music? And again, what if he saw the actual work of Beethoven and would that would that shatter his purpose or um, notion of identity because he was an already established um, masterful composer? What if he couldn't fulfill that? So you guys know the concept of the red team. So the red team is somebody who helps you with future decision making by finding fault with what your major proposed action is and doing sort of the opposite. And surprisingly, this has been remarkably effective. All militaries in the world now use it and, and so on. It's a sort of devil's advocate that you simply turn things around and say, suppose this doesn't work, how would it not work? How? So you can imagine something that's the opposite of cloning, which is maximum diversity. How could we use you know, technology to make sure that future humanity is maximally diverse? And so that this would be technology to ensure that sort of minority populations continue to be represented in the future and you know are well looked after and so on. You know, you can imagine a lot of positive social action that would have that effect of, of making the world more diverse. And so I think red teaming is a very important concept for you to think about because humans have so many built in biases. When they're deciding about something, they think they're making that decision based on completely rational things. But actually, all these biases come into it and simplifications that are wrong and, and so on. So I think here we have made a simple example of that. We, we, we all sense, everybody in the room senses, that cloning would lead us in the wrong direction. So maybe there's a lesson there. What would the opposite of that be? You know, how could we maximize diversity? What would be the advantages of that, and so on? I mean, when you were just saying that, immediately I thought of the genetic editing that has been trying to going on to like uh, you know for those like uh, the receptor mutated babies that right. were born. That's still very controversial and still very. Yeah, so that's also just as bad. In other words, if there's no limits, no rules for messing with the you know, genetic code, and if you're just arbitrarily going in and saying, oh, okay, well, I want to make this person immune to HIV infection, well, that's just one of like a, a billion threats in the world, right? So that could weaken something else and, 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 and create other problems. It, it's, it's probably not absolutely clear either how to be 100% su successful at, at making that alteration. So then, how do you decide what things you are going to allow, what kind of testing and so on, you know? It, it's, it's a very interesting challenge, but maybe what is safest is to think of what should our goals be, right? I mean, that's that's pretty safe. That doesn't have, like, side effects. Is to say, okay, well, we, we've identified something that's about as um, 
you know, apocalyptic, dystopic as we can possibly think of, how, how can we be maximally certain that this doesn't happen, that the world stays diverse, not only genetically diverse, but in terms of the uh, ideas considered and, you know, the richness of, of the fabric of human intellectual interaction, you know, and, and, and so on. So, one could fairly safely sort of sit around and come up with what you would think would be the optimum situation for society. And then, then it's just a matter of how, how to get there, or if you're already there, how to, you know, retain what you have as, as opposed to losing it. Well, my next slide kind of contradicts that. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Great team, great team. It brings up Murphy's Law, yeah. which is how, um, which problems that can occur will most likely occur. And again, the idea of the potential dystopian future. And uh, the novel by Aldous Huxley, um, which was written in 1932, which is a uh, dystopian satire on sex where sexual reproduction is considered taboo, even obscene. A set of people created through cloning, a set of no, a set of people are created through cloning and sorted into genetically predetermined classes. That's just the plot synopsis. And um, in it he explores the notions of mental health and clones in society, such as um, there's no social stability without individual stability. And this is assuming that um, at least 50% of the population or more would be um, human clones um, and how that would affect everyone. And Jenny might think it's interesting. He micro-dosed a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. It's probably all we could think about this stuff in 1932. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then, so now we've mentioned the requirement of new and specialized healthcare establishments, which would deal with the uh, potential physical, mental, and biological problems of uh, mass production of humans through somatic cell nuclear transfer, um, and the institutions and resources that would aid and tend to the mental health of these clones and just a society where people are living with clones and interacting with them. And now, um, just uh, considering downfalls of cloning and revolutionary technology in general, um, such as uh, nuclear power, which is really beneficial in powering cities and, by, and not producing carbon emissions, but we could have disasters like Chernobyl, which is uh, could be a metaphor or applied to human reproductive cloning. Um, so, a, a downfall of human cloning is that, in fact, they would not be enhanced humans. They would still be susceptible to death, aging, and disease. And um, do the benefits of cloning outweigh the negatives? Because as this is a largely outcome-driven um, procedure. Um, and is human cloning a meaningful and beneficial pursuit? And why, at the end of the day, would we choose to clone humans? And what are the long-term effects of human cloning on humanity? Like genetic, and um, this brings the ancient revisits the ancient idea of duty in medicine and non maleficence in, in medicine, um, established by Hippocrates in um, 370 BC, where um, the doctor's oath from that time, including to now 2019, is that first of all, do no harm. And is this procedure harmful? And now I'm going to conclude with the concept of medicine writ large, which is um, human enhancement on all realms, spiritual, moral, physical, and um, biologically, I guess. And um, it seems that, uh, in conclusion, that human cloning possesses an existential risk, which is injures to the fabric and dignity of humanity and human heritage. Um, and the majority of people 
both general public to biological scientists are against human cloning. Um, the National Genome Research Institute states that human cloning may conflict with long-standing religious and societal values about human dignity possibly infringing upon principles of individual freedom, um, identity, and autonomy, and which we discussed earlier. And, and so these are some questions to consider if anyone, the first one I think is most important. Uh, will human cloning ultimately justify or hinder moral and spiritual aspects of humanity, heritage, and well-being? To Can we take uh, some stabs at answers? Um, I, I just think I go back to probably junior high school science where you learn about sexual reproduction and the benefits of having uh, two sets of genes. And I don't know if I overly internalized that, but to me it seems like a really important part of, of what we're getting at. I could see cloning as being beneficial if, in fact, humans are no longer fertile or able to reproduce sexually. Um, but I think that uh, when it comes to you know, what is the essence of being human, uh, sexual reproduction is, is vital. Well, you know, you, you can think of survival the fittest, right? I, I mean, it, it's slow, it's, it's inexact, but it's the way that we, you know, evolved up until this time. And this would certainly wreck it. I mean, you're not making these decisions on the basis of uh, fitness. And you could imagine, as you say, that as time goes on, if you're just cloning something that began as a, you know, a product of a sperm and an egg way, way back, but as you keep going on, probably more and more errors would be introduced and, and you, you would, would eventually end up with something that is actually less fit. Um, Ch Ch chances are our students don't have the experience of uh, reproducing cassette tapes. Yeah. But anybody who did know that if you take the original and make a copy of that, and then a copy of the copy, and a copy of the copy, the download, you know, it, it's going to sound pretty bad. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I don't know if the metaphor applies to it. Yeah. And and so the, the way music is reproduced now, that doesn't really happen. Like, you know, if, if, if you steal a song or, or a movie, it, it's likely to be, be pretty much just as good as, you know, the uh, original now. So, but I think it, it, it is, um, still a, a useful um, lesson about things not to do. Like there isn't a student here saying, no, no, I think this is a good idea. And like in a different group of students, I don't think that there would be somebody who thought, well, gee, the rest of the students don't like this idea, but it sounds great to me. Why would it sound great? Well. If you had a like um, cult leader, future cult leader, right, who was going to have, you know, create some horrible cult where people, you know, mass suits, suits that kind of thing. maybe that sort of person, you know, Charles uh, Manson might have thought that this was good, right? Yeah, he he might have really liked this, so. But we don't get very many Charles Manson-like <laughs> students, luckily. So this is always going to be, uh, um, you know, something that I think most of us feel is 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 really really the wrong way to go. Um, so I mean, in terms of like medical applications on your question list, I feel as though like for sure there's always going to be that debate of whether this is moral or whether if we do this it would benefit us at all or if it was just cause uh, dilemmas, moral dilemmas. Um, but I really like that slide that you had on the bio bag because, um, pr uh, specifically because you can, I guess, incubate an, uh, a, a biological being without the harm or like the, um, not the harm, but like the, um, 
the, the drawbacks of, let's say, a pregnancy? And what would the social implications be if a, a woman didn't have to get pregnant anymore? She could work, not have to hinder her career, and still ha make a viable offspring. So I feel like there are possible medical applications, but again, there's still those conundrums uh, and dilemmas that we have to take into consideration. Yeah, currently that doesn't work very well, and it's very unpopular in medical science. There are very few people wanting to study that. It's not just very few women, but very few men too, wanting to study you know, the artificial womb. It's a really unpopular area. And if you think about normal pregnancy, the woman is active, the, the womb moves during the day. That, that's, that's quite an important part of this. Otherwise, you get accidentally squared off corners and stuff, you know, a very lumpy looking child, right? <laughs> Which isn't what you want. So there, and there are probably all sorts of other things, you know, the characteristics of the amniotic fluid, the, even the sounds that the fetus hears filtered through the mother's body and all, all this kind of thing. A lot of that is important to normal development, and, and, and we would be losing much more than we really understand if, if we make it completely artificial. I'm sure it'll come sometime, but only slower than we might think. Well, we need to get on to your presentation. Yeah. Um, and uh, no one has to stay, but you, you, you can stay. I'm staying.